Hello, and welcome to the Bear Crop Science Pipeline Media Briefing. I'm Corey Whiteman, Global Head of Innovation and Digital Communications. And on behalf of Bear, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'll be your moderator, and together we'll discuss how Bear Crop Science R&D Pipeline is addressing key global challenges through sustainable solutions that empower farmers to grow more productively and eff efficiently. Dr. Bob Ryder, head of R&D at Crop Science, will take you through this year's R&D pipeline and how our innovations are using fewer resources, advancing a carbon smart future for agriculture, and producing solutions for fuller harvests. A Q&A will follow the presentation where you'll be able to ask questions to Bob Ryder, as well as Dr. Rochelle Rama, head of small molecules. Dr. Benoit Hartman, head of biologics, and Dr. Mike Graham, head of plant breeding. All of you listening are invited to submit questions through the Teams, uh, Microsoft Teams chat box, which is at the right hand corner of your screen. Please be sure to include your name, country, and your media outlet you uh, represent. We will be opening the chat box about 15 minutes before the Q&A session, but you're welcome to submit your questions at any time. As a reminder, the focus of this call is the crop science R&D pipeline. If you have any questions outside this topic, please follow up with a member of your media relations team following this call. Today's call may include statements concerning future events and financial results. Please refer to bear.com for official financial disclosures. Please note that this call is being recorded and transcribed. With that, I'll now hand it over to Bob Ryder, head of R&D at Bear Crop Science. Thank you, Corey, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to share with you some of the excitement that we have over the many advances that we continue to make with our science in serving farmers around the world in our goal of helping to shape agriculture to a new and sustainable place. It's an exciting time for us, and we're really proud of the work and the progress that we continue to make. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. So of course, as you know, the world is facing a number of different challenges and agriculture is often at the heart of many of those challenges. You know, we have a goal to help the world feed a growing population that will ultimately reach over 10 billion people by 2050. Yet at the same time, because of climate change and other environmental issues, we need to help agriculture continue to achieve greater sustainability. And there are numerous challenges that are taking place on each and individual farm across the globe. But one of the things I'm very proud of and I think is very foundational for us is that everything that we do at Bayer Crop Science Research has a goal of achieving improvements, not just in grower productivity, but how we can combine that productivity together with having a smaller impact on the environment. And I'm proud to say that everything that we have in our pipeline is directly targeted at achieving that goal. And ultimately, it's our goal to serve every farmer, every customer, and do that around the world and bring greater success, both for them economically, but ultimately with the smallest impact possible. Next slide. And why can we do that? And it's really because we have a very unique position at Bayer. We as an organization have over 7,000 employees in research and development working every day to achieve these outcomes. We deliver to the market well over 500 hybrids and varieties in an array of crops over the many key row crops such as corn and soybeans, cotton, oilseed rape and wheat, but also the numerous vegetable crops that we also breed in. We make key advances in projects across biotechnology, crop protection, biologics, and digital. And these projects ultimately enter the market and have a positive impact. We have many, many formulations that we launch each year and new active ingredients in the crop protection space and hundreds of registrations that we support around the globe. And of course, finally, it means a financial investment by Bayer. We invest over $2 billion annually in our R&D budget in crop science. That number is nearly two times bigger than any other company in our space. 
And I think it's a testament to Bayer's commitment to agriculture and our goal of helping to shape agriculture in the right way. And then, of course, finally, it creates an economic return for Bayer with a valued pipeline of nearly 30 billion in peak sales. We'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to start in crop protection and talk about the work that we're doing there and how we're going to achieve the overall goal of not just securing and protecting growers productivity with crop protection products, but how we can do that with a continued reduction in the impact on the environment. Next slide. For me, it's exciting to talk about first the long history and success that we've had at Bayer. Over the last 15 years alone, we've launched a new active ingredient into the market on average each year over that 15 year period. And that is new and exciting and differentiating um, innovation. Because when we look at the overall environmental profile of the products that we've launched into the market, they have the lowest of any company in our class. It's a testament to the innovation of our teams in crop science in terms of bringing world-class chemistry to the market that serves farmers and helps protect the environment. But we're not stopping with what we've brought to the market. We continue that innovation with new chemistries. I just wanted to highlight a couple for you. First, we're bringing the first new mode of action in major row crops in the last 30 years in the herbicide space. And you can see the pictures on the left of our new molecule that's now in phase three and continues to go toward the market. It has excellent weed control, particularly over the grass species. And, but what's exciting for me is the tremendous safety profile that this chemistry also has. And the fact that it's a brand new mode of action, which is critical for farmers to continue to be able to use products successfully and help in our goal of not just providing more effective weed control, but helping to make sure that that environmental footprint is small. On the right side, you can see Zivana a new fungicide, which is best in class with its mode of action. And you can see the very low use rates that can be achieved using this product, yet having very high success rate in terms of controlling the fungal diseases that this particular chemistry is targeted toward. It's our goal to continue to launch new chemistries like these with their very small footprint, but very significant and important effect in terms of helping our grower customers being successful. And in the future, we'll continue to not only leverage these chemistries, but we'll wrap them together with digital to provide further enhancement for our customers. Next slide, please. We also make significant investment and are very proud of the work that we do in biologicals. You can see that we're on more than 60 million acres with our biological portfolio, and we have well over 20 products in the market today alone in the biologic space. You can see the numbers in terms of the number of pipeline candidates and third party molecules that we're also assessing from different sources. I should correct myself, they aren't necessarily molecules, they're often just live or inactive biological products. I'll highlight one flipper, which is actually a biological insecticide, which shows great success in terms of controlling key insects in crops like apples. One of the things we also like to do is use our biologicals and help make recommendations for growers to combine them together with our chemistries. This helps growers in terms of providing better control against various insects or diseases, for example, but also increases the opportunity for growers in terms of potentially the marketability of their crops in different regions around the world. When you combine all these things together with our chemistry and our biological prowess, it really does allow us to achieve our goal of reducing the environmental footprint in crop protection in the environment and around the world with our farmer customers. Next slide, please. Let's shift gears now and talk a little bit about where we see the world going and what our goal and what we can do to help increase and create a more carbon smart future for agriculture in terms of how we can help with greenhouse gas reductions. Next slide. The anchoring point of where we're going is really around digital and also how we can create financial incentive for farmer customers in terms of further sequestering carbon on their farm and how we turn agriculture 
from a net creator of carbon and release into the environment to one that is ultimately about sequestering carbon on each and individual farm. We created a system and a program in our carbon initiative where, that we're using today, and we have over 2,500 of our farmer customers in both the US and Brazil that are participating. And you can see the number of acres involved in this program. In this program, we are financially recognizing farmers for doing certain agronomic practices that further sequesters carbon into the ground. What excites me about this isn't just about the fact that farmers are being rewarded to doing the right thing, and we have that economic incentive, but that allows us to further invest and use innovation to further help them do that better. We can use our biotechnology tools, our crop protection tools, our biologics, and our breeding programs to further help in this objective of sequestering carbon, putting it into the ground and keeping it in the ground. Later, a highlight for you, our short stature corn product and how it can also have a fit in, ter in terms of further sequestering carbon. We're also partnering with companies like Microsoft, which will help us in this digital journey in terms of both tracking and identifying carbon and then making sure that that carbon can be recognized in terms of how much carbon is being sequestered and how that might be used in terms of insets and offsets in the market. Using these digital tools together with our other capabilities, I think is really a great one-two punch in terms of making a climate, climate smart agricultural system worldwide. Next slide. Now let's turn gears and talk about our breeding capabilities and our biotechnology capabilities. Because the first decision often that a grower makes is what seed should I plant into the ground? And that important decision is fueled by our innovation engines in these spaces. Let's go to the next slide. I'm trained as a plant breeder, and I've seen the evolution of breeding over many, many years in my career. And what I'm so excited to see is this next page that we're turning over in our breeding journey in terms of how we breed. We're a long way from the days where I would stand in the field together with my colleagues and we take notes with pencils and write down and look at plants and make decisions about what we should advance into the market. Precision breeding is a whole new way to think about how we breed seeds. In the past, breeders would make crosses and create large populations, and we would go through a process of selecting what we would believe was the best. We would test it in many environments and ultimately try to place those products where we thought they had a best fit for the grower. With precision breeding, we're turning all of this on its head. We're designing in advance through our incredible knowledge that we now have of our germplasm, our field knowledge, our genomic knowledge, the tools that we're applying in terms of creating information about each individual plant that we have. And this gives us the power together with things like artificial intelligence, the vast data capabilities we have, and the ability to bring it all together from a genetic perspective in our large um, greenhouse capabilities. We have greenhouse capabilities in North and South America and around the world that we use to be able to bring those genetics together. And then we can place them on the right environment in the right situations to have grower customers have great success. It'll be a few years until products come out of precision breeding but I fundamentally believe they will be step change products and create great productivity for the future of growers around the world. It's an exciting challenge and an exciting time, but it couldn't have been done five and 10 years ago because we didn't have the knowledge, the capabilities, the computational power, and the know-how to put it all together and make this happen for our customers. It'll be exciting to see the evolution over the next few years. Next slide. But of course, once we create that high productivity in those seeds, we need to continue to protect them. Of course, we did that with our crop protection products, but our biotechnology products are equally important. In cotton this year, I'm proud to announce that we're launching our Thrive On technology. This is the first sucking piercing insect biotechnology trait in the market. And we're still in a stewarded launch this year, waiting for our last import approvals. But the interest by growers is very, very high, and it's going to be a great fit together with our existing 
bull guard and extend platforms that we today have with cotton growers in the United States. But we're not stopping there with new technologies for sucking piercing insects. We're also working to advance our next generation insect platform with Bullguard 4, where we'll continue to evolve and create new modes of action for growers and help them protect their crops against insect pests and cotton. And then we're also working on next generation herbicide tolerance systems that will allow our cotton farmer customers to have many additional modes of action and be able to better optimize the use of herbicides to protect their crops from weeds. It's our continued commitment to generate next generation innovation across those key problems that growers face every year in terms of weed and insect control. Next slide, please. And when we think about cotton, we can also think about crops like soybean, where this last year we launched our Intacta 2 Extend platform in Brazil. This is our second generation insect protection platform, now including capabilities for additional weed control for growers in Brazil and the South, South American market. We launched on over 800,000 acres in the 2021-22 20, growing season. And next year we intend to be on over 6 million acres with growers in Brazil. It's a very exciting technology with now three modes of action for insect protection and the addition of the dicamba system the growers can then use in a pre-plant option to help control weeds that are they're facing each and every day in their fields. We also, of course, aren't stopping there. Just like in cotton, we're now working in soybean for our third generation Intacta system and our fourth generation Intacta system is now in phase one of development. Each time continuing to evolve and replace and add modes of action to ensure that we're always well ahead of the insect pressures that growers face in their farms in Brazil. It's exciting to see the progress we continue to make and it's a testament to our ability to continue to use science and bring innovation to the farm. Next slide, please. I'm also excited by the fact that we're launching our next generation corn rootworm product. And what's novel about this corn rootworm product against those in the past is this one's based on RNA interference. So it's a first and best in class new mode of action that we're applying and being able to leverage on farmer fields in North and South America. You can see that we're going to launch three different product types in the US, Canadian and South American markets, taking advantage of our corn rootworm three product using the RNAi technology. It'll be, of course, complemented by the existing BT capabilities that control corn rootworm. But it's a very critical new technology to battle against resistance coming from corn rootworm pressure in different parts of the world. We're super excited by what this technology can do. And I think the pictures in the bottom of the slide really speak for themselves in terms of the differentiation that they create for our customers that use the technology. Next slide, please. So I'm going to close and talk about maybe the product that for us might bring the most excitement, not necessarily because we don't value the many products that we're delivering to the market that I talked about previously, but our short stature corn product opens up a real opportunity to think differently about the kinds of products and how we bring them to the market. Moving from just bringing traits, crop protection chemistries to the market or seed products but building and bringing the capabilities of an entire system to a grower to help growers really optimize how they farm every single acre that they use to produce and be productive. Next slide, please. So we're harnessing the power of our short stature corn product um, system. We first um, introduced short stature corn in Mexico a number of years ago. And it's an exciting evolution for us to be able to now take what was started in Mexico and continue to evolve it and move it into additional geographies. Next year, we're going to have our first groundbreakers with growers where we'll have 150 early adopter growers in the US that will be able to enjoy and take advantage of using short stature corn hybrids. It's exciting for us because there's still very much for us to be able to learn in terms of how growers can take full advantage of the short stature corn hybrids that we're going to deploy into the market. And you can see the tremendous fit that we see for 
for short stature corn across hundreds of millions of acres around the globe. We intend in 24 to launch the overall system because what we want to help growers do is not just think again as this of an individual product, but how they can use it as a system, change their fertility practices, their crop protection practices, their, their growing practices in terms of plant densities, and how they ultimately farm and sequester carbon on those same acres. We want to bring it all together for them with a system that's digitally enabled, knowledge driven, and really maximizes productivity and minimizes the environmental footprint that a grower is trying to achieve on each individual acre. We have three different ways that we bring the technology to the market. Both breeding, biotechnology, and gene editing versions are in our pipeline for this very important technology. Next slide, please. So I hope I've given you a bit of an understanding of the many capabilities that we have at Bayer and the great technologies that we're trying to bring to the marketplace. Our tremendous crop protection products that continue to evolve and are continuing to have higher and higher safety standards, yet bring tremendous efficacy and success to each individual grower that uses them. Our great seed products and our biotechnology products when combined together, deliver a tremendous one-two punch to helping to solve grower, problem, grower problems and maximize their productivity. But we don't stop there. Our digital investment is helping maximize the uses of those products and really deliver to growers great new innovation and improve their ability to really use those products and get the best return on investment and helping to secure carbon on their farms. It's a very high bar we set for ourselves, but we're excited on the journey that agriculture is on and the journey that we participate in with it. We really believe that we can shape agriculture with science, with innovation, and the things that we do every day. And the thing I'll leave you with is the passion that my team and everyone at Bayer has about wanting to do the right thing for agriculture, for society, and ultimately for our food supply. It's a tremendous, conviction that we have and I'm really really proud of the things that we've been able to do so far and the things that we're set up for in the future. So with that I will turn it back to Corey and we'll go to Q&A. Corey. Great thank you Bob. Um, what an exciting uh, por uh, portfolio we have uh, laid out in terms of the pipeline. Um, I encourage everyone to continue to bring in your questions. We do only have one question right now, but maybe just to sort of get us kick started. Uh, Bob, why don't you tell us um, of, of the things that you presented here and there's so many um, innovations. Uh, tell us maybe what you think is the most exciting as we look into 2022. Well, I, uh, I hope you thought it was short stature corn for the presentation, but I'll just reinforce it one more time. Um, I, I think the, the fact that it allows us to bring an entire system to a grower, and, and maybe I should also talk a little more about when I talk about what a system ultimately I think really means for the grower. We think about it as a way of having a whole different relationship with the grower in terms of how they're buying the product. It means we're selling to the grower something that goes beyond the seed itself. The seed might be at the core of it, but it's really about the entire experience for the grower of using that seed and ultimately helping that grower maximize their productivity, helping to maximize the carbon sequestration that they will probably be trying to do and minimizing the environmental impact of the things that they're doing. The beautiful thing about short stature corn, for example, is it helps the grower with standability, but it does two other things. It increases their ability to use their equipment and get in there and use crop protection products more efficiently. We can use our digital tools to help the grower identify when and where they need to spray. And they have the opportunity to get in late season with those crop protection products at the right time and in the right place because of the fact that the crop is shorter. The other advantage it creates for the grower is the fact that it can help them in terms of their fertility regime. If they can get into the, again, if they can get in season with equipment later in season, they can be more precise about their nutrient applications. They can make rescue applications in parts of the field with the right types of knowledge of where they need more nitrogen and where they don't need to apply it. So 
with the inherent ability of the crop to better stand wind and other things that knock the crop down and create more productivity from the fact that there's more harvestable corn to the fact that it enables a grower to think differently about their agronomic practices, I think that's pretty exciting. And then the last part that I believe is, is while we still have a lot of work to do to identify ultimately what is happening, we know that when we shorten the crop at the top, we also probably made the, there might be some differences down below ground. And those are gonna be important in terms of uptake of water, nutrients, and even potentially sequestering carbon. Because you can imagine if we have a larger root system below ground, that means ultimately there's gonna be more carbon below ground. So I think the fact that this single product represents so many things across the, all the work that a farmer does through the season, to me makes it really ultimately very exciting to talk about, to think about, and to bring into the market. Great, thank you, Bob. A very exciting technology coming. Uh, our first question, uh, and I will go to the questions in the chat, uh, comes from Germany. Klaus, editor at Agro Europe. Uh, could you please explain the predicted 30 billion peak sales potential? Is this the maximum additional sales year to be reached in 2042 without taking into account the current sales? Um, so I'll take that one. So the, the way peak sales are calculated is it's it's the number if you add up for each of those individual products at their point of peak sale. So it isn't a single in point in time because of course the peak sales for different products is achieved at different points. Um, a simple way maybe to think about it is that um, I believe by 2030 roughly 60% of the peak sales will be achieved in this portfolio. But there are a number of products, of course, that are going to achieve their peak sales over different time points into the 2030s. Um, I do know that, for example, 80% of the peak sales potential of this pipeline will be achieved by 2035. But some of the products, of course, will be um, probably on their on the decline and they'll be on and, and reducing their peak from their peak sale point that would have happened earlier. So hopefully that helps you to better understand how peak sales are calculated and ultimately what the 30 billion number represents. Great, thank you, Bob. This next question, uh, we'll have Bob, you start, and then Rochelle, perhaps you can um, add on. And the question comes from Progressive Farmer from Pam Smith. Um, can you tell us more about the new herbicide mode of action advancing? What crop is targeted pre or post? Actually, how about I'll just turn it all over to Rochelle. She'll okay. be in the best position to take through the details. Rochelle? Yeah, so we are very, very excited about this uh, new mode of action that we are working on for sure. So it's, uh, um, and it's the first new mode of action uh, in post-emergent uh, we control over the over the last uh, 30 years. And when you are in r and I can tell you that you are, when you are putting on the market a new, uh, a new mode of action, it, it's something uh, really, really uh, big for us, and we are very proud uh, about the team uh, to have done that. So it's um, very, very effective on broad uh, wheat control uh, and, and um, against uh, very uh, difficult grass to, uh, to control, like uh, rye grass, goose grass, or saw grass. Uh, and also, um, it's for all major uh, row crop that we are developing this uh, uh, herbicide. We are still working on the positioning uh, of, the, of the herbicide. But it's not just one product uh, because uh, we are having a, a family and we are working also in discovery on this new mode of action for other market segments. Rochelle, maybe you could also comment on our overall commitment to new modes of action and our early discovery efforts. Yeah, yeah, it's true that uh, it's super important to have uh, to, to bring to the market uh, a new mode of action and new uh, uh, innovation. So new mode of action, why? Because uh, we need also to overcome the, all the resistance uh, which are uh, developing, especially if you look at disease control, 80% eh, uh, of, of, of the, the market is uh, done on four uh, mode of action which are there on the market since quite a long time. So uh, we are committed to uh, really and we have taken a bold decision, I would say, to stop uh, working in discovery on non mode of action, mode of action which are already on the market. We would like really to develop uh, a new mode of action and which are more, um, uh, maybe better for, for uh, having a better safety profile 
And, and this is something that we can do today. We were not able to do to, uh, before because we have new knowledge and uh, we are leveraging the, the, the digital um, efforts and, and progress we have made. Great, thank you, Rochelle. Question coming in from Argentina. Uh, is Bear working on new varieties of fruits and vegetables? So maybe Bob, you can. Uh, how about I'll, I'll 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 turn it over to Mike and he can he can answer the question because it's mostly about our breeding pipeline. You, Mike. Good morning, everyone, and great to uh, great to be here today. And, and so the simple answer is yes. Um, and so a number of the technologies that Bob shared as we went through the presentation today of how we're thinking differently about applying new technologies uh, to, to different parts of the pipeline to enable us to design that next generation of products are very similar to what we're doing both in row crops and the bread veg organization. And our, our veg team is well on its way to leveraging a number of these new capabilities to build best in class new products going forward for the veg and fruit industries. And just to clarify, so we breed in the vegetable in a number of vegetable crops. We don't currently breed in any of the fruit crops, but because of our crop protection portfolio, we have very active participation in the overall horticulture market segments. So, um, and of course, there are many, many fruit crops in that that we work with growers every day on, but not directly in terms of seed. And of course, most of those crops are not seed produced you know, a large number of them are clonally produced, so they're not uh, a target for breeding. Great. Next question coming in from uh, George in Greece at Greenbox Country. Um, when is the Thrive On technology for cotton coming to Europe? And then second part of that question is, what is the performance yield from the short stature corn? So I'll take the first question and then Mike, I'll turn the short stature corn yield question over to you. Um, so right now um, we are not planning on bringing Thrive On technology with cotton to the European market. Um, I mean, that's uh, the decision you have to recognize, of course, the regulatory challenges and, uh, and the market sizes opportunities that factor into decisions like that. So um, we, will, we will at this point, it'll be limited to the Americas. And, and on the short stature corn, um, so we, we've seen great progress in terms of performance in short stature corn. Um, as Bob highlighted, we started first with product development in Mexico. And our products and our launches there in Mexico were on par with what our competitive performance was in the marketplace. So very strong uh, performance. As we've looked at our data here over the last several years in the US, where we have a number of products we're evaluating in a short statured corn um, configuration. They also are performing on par with kind of the, the market leaders or some of our, our more elite products that we have in the marketplace. Obviously, we're still in the process of combining the trait with our elite germplasm and, and as they get closer to groundbreakers and launch, we expect those perform that performance to be very equivalent to a number of the, uh, the elite products that we would have in the market. Great, thank you, Mike. Next question is coming from Marcel uh, at European Seed Magazine. Is Bear working on biostimulants? And if so, what type of biostimulants? Benoit, you want to take that? Sure, so um, let's start with the definition because there are different definitions of uh, biostimulants. So uh, let's say uh, it's a product that are improving, improving plant nutrition. Um, and definitely we're working on that and what type. Uh, so looking at different application types, uh, is it foliar application, soil application, but especially I would say we are looking at, uh, at seed treatment applications. So combining um, biologicals together with uh, chemicals on the seeds. Um, we have different efforts here and uh, I think it's a great way actually to, to complement pest and disease control on seed with a new way to improve yield and optimize uh, um, fertilizer use here. So that's a core focus, definitely uh, uh, for corn, soybean, we're looking into wheat also. Uh, is it for the US, uh, for Latin America? Um, I understand the com question is coming from someone in Europe, but also definitely in Europe. There's a new regulation in Europe for, for biostimulants just being introduced right now, which will help actually uh, also to bring new products to the market. And part of the pipeline product that were, was mentioned by Bob Reiter is one product for 
specifically a biostimulant for corn in Europe. Great, thank you, Benoit. We'll keep this going in the next question. This will be for you, Bob, uh, from Luis in Brazil at uh, Globo uh, Rule Magazine. Rural producers are currently facing the effects of rising input prices. How can these new technologies help in this difficult time? Yeah, I think uh, they're very important, actually, because even though it's sometimes, you know, you think that when economic conditions are tough, um, that's an opportunity or a need for a grower to reduce their their input costs, and certainly that's true. They want to, you know, they want to be very efficient in the dollars that they're putting out and putting at risk before they plant. The reality is the beautiful thing about these technologies, in particular things like our Intacta 2 platform, is they create a higher degree of certainty that a grower is going to have a harvestable and economic you know, a strong economic return on the risk of the investments they're making in fertilizer, in seed, in crop protection products. So, um, you know, I'm a foundational believer that um, these kinds of investments, even though, you know, they do cost money for a grower at the front end, they create much greater certainty that they're going to have a productive and strong economic return on the back end, um, regardless of whether, you know, commodity prices are high or low or input costs are, are high or low. So, um, you know, I think that's what's beautiful about technologies like our traits or the crop protection products we deliver or the high yields that we can achieve with our products is they create greater certainty for a grower. And, and that, I think that's very foundational because farming is a risky business. Great. Thank you, Bob. And here's a quick question coming in from Italy. The RNAi corn, um, will it be available in Europe? Well, I think it's a little bit like the answer on cotton. Um, unfortunately, biotechnology products don't have a favorable and regulatory framework in Europe. Um, we would love to bring these products to the European market. Um, we see that they would have great fit for farmers, um, but there are, of course, as well, well understood by all of you in the audience, right? There are, there are other challenges fit, you know, in terms of biotechnology acceptance in the European market. Um, so, um, we have no intention at this point. Okay, and we'll stick with you, Bob, on this next question from Steve Davis at AgriPulse. Um, when do you think glyphosate alternative will be available commercially? Also, how do how do we define uh, lowest impact in class? Yeah, uh, let me take the second part first, and actually, I'm going to have Rochelle answer the question on the likelihood of a glyphosate replacement, and maybe why that's so difficult um, and why there's nothing on the horizon. So um, as far as the economic impact, so what we've done is we've worked with um, third party academics in Europe that helped us to identify um, and build a, a model that could be used to assess, uh, assess the overall environmental impact of a individual chemistry. And then we they did an analysis looking at um, the individual chemistry, what its environmental impact impact and footprint and it takes into account all sorts of things, right? The amount of the chemistry that's used, the total acres that it's being applied to, um, what's the what's the impact on uh, various parameters and, you know, with environment, you're looking at things like its impact on um, non-target insects, for example, or non-target diseases. And so you can do a full, really a very full and deep analysis um, of your entire portfolio and the chemistries that are out there in the market today. Um, and so from that third party assessment and modeling, um, you know, we looked at our total footprint because we as Bayer, we're one of the largest uh, providers of crop protection products in the industry. Um, and what's exciting is, is that despite the fact that we have a very large footprint out there with customers, the impact of that footprint is actually, you know, amazingly small. Ball. And I think, again, a testament to the kinds of products that we have brought to the market and the innovation behind them to make sure that that impact is really small. So it was really exciting to see the work by, um, you know, someone else doing kind of an independent assessment of sorts because it's not our model, it's it's their model. So. And then, Rochelle, maybe comment on glyphosate replacement. What I can say is that we are not really working on, on, on uh, replacing the, the, the glyphosate because uh, we are convinced that the glyphosate still have uh, its place uh, uh, and a role to play in our portfolio. And uh, 
uh, we are more focusing on on uh, on really bringing uh, new mode of actions and and uh, very specific, maybe also per uh, per uh, per crop. Um, so we are investing quite a lot currently on on uh, on with uh, with control. And we have in uh, early, we are having uh, uh, two or three uh, mode of act, new mode of action that uh, we are working currently and we are advancing, uh, hoping that uh, they will reach the, the market soon. But we are not looking at really, really an alternative to the glyphosate, honestly. Great, thank you, Rochelle. Um, question from Patrick Thomas at the Wall Street Journal. Um, he wanted us to be able to elaborate more on the peak potential uh, sales of the 1 billion euros in North America for short stature corn. His question in here frames it in 2023, but I don't think that uh, that, that was the uh, associated year with that number, Bob. So maybe you can um, uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, and then his second part is, how did the company breach that projection and what hesitations do farmers have about it? So um, let me start with the very last part of the question and then I'll kind of go backwards into the into the economics. So um, we've done some amount of surveying with growers and, and had the opportunity to talk to growers about short stature corn. So we talk to them about it and kind of gauge their interest and then we take them out into the field and then show it to them. And, you know, just maybe two facts for you to consider. So first of all, when we show customers um, short stature corn and ask them, are you interested in planting it? 75, nearly 75% of them come back and say that they would plant up to one third of their acres to short stature corn the next year, if it were available. Um, and when we look at the overall interest in it, to give you some context, there's more interest in short stature corn right now in terms of grower input as we talk to them about it than there ever has been for any biotechnology trait that we ever introduced into the market. So that's a pretty strong testament, I think, to the excitement that is out there in terms of growers' interest in short stature corn. Now, you know, um, the journey's gonna start as we kind of start to put it into the hands of growers in 23 and beyond, and maybe I'll go to your question really about the value proposition and the peak sales. So the value to a grower comes in a couple of different ways. So first of all, there's kind of an intrinsic value proposition of the product. You know, Mike alluded to the yield parity, but that yield parity is there as long as the wind isn't blowing. Um, when the wind blows and, and corn falls, and that happens a lot, then a grower is going to get incremental yield in the context of they, he's got more standability. More standability translates into more yield potential for the farmer. So there's sort of this direct impact of the standability of the crop for the farmer. And then there's the opportunities to farm differently and get more maximization of value back from the grower in terms of how they do their fertility and get more productivity out of their fertility, how they maximize and get more value out of their crop protection products. So that digital overlay together with how they're doing their agronomic practices is another significant opportunity in terms of value creation for the grower. And then the last piece for me is really going to be around carbon and risk. I personally think that short stature corn helps reduce a grower's overall net risk with their crop. And I do also think that, that those agronomic practices, if we can create better knowledge for a grower on their decision making, that can help to simplify their decision making. And one thing that I've learned over the many years working in this space is products that help simplify a grower's decision making and execution have inherent strong value for a grower. Um, if you just look at the history of things like the Roundup Ready system, the weed control obviously was a very important value proposition because the grower was able to use a really effective chemistry and have a better weed control. The simplicity of the system had a huge value proposition to the grower because they had certainty on their, in, on their weed control practices their families didn't have to go out into the fields. They didn't have to hire people to go hook weeds in the field. Um, and they had time to spend with their families. You know, these are in, you know, these aren't tangible, necessarily tangible value propositions, but these are the kinds of opportunities I think short stature corn represents as a system for a grower that can simplify what they do and how they do it. And of course, the direct impact that a crop like that can have in terms of just direct impact for things like wind events and other kinds of risk events. So 
a little bit of a multi-layered answer on where the value is, but th that's at the at the core of introducing a product that is really going to be core to a system. As far as when the value comes for Bear, um, it's further out. You know, again, we're launching three technologies. In the United States, we're going to be introducing our breeding version of the technology of short stature corn in the 23-24 window. We'll use that to bring grower familiarity to the system because we we can't we can't launch that technology across our broad portfolio of genetics. Um, it doesn't make sense for us to do it that way. And also, we want to continue to learn with growers and help them learn how to maximize use of the system. Our biotechnology product, which is going to launch around 2027, is really the anchoring point where we can deploy the product across a very large uh, amount of our, pretty much all of our genetics in the U.S. and, and, and Canada, and, and in South America as well, where we'll have the opportunity to have a biotechnology version. And those are going to be the big unlocks. And that really is the driver to getting, for example, in North America to peak sales potential of one billion. Now, if you launch in 27, it'll be a few years until you get to the peak sale numbers. So it'll be in the it'll be in the 2030s. But that should give you some context of, of where we're going with short stature corn. And of course, in behind that, we have gene editing versions of short stature corn that we ultimately believe will be able to deploy in other regions of the world where biotechnology products won't be the first choice. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, pivoting to another topic, um, and I love the variety in all of these questions. Um, this next one comes from Leonardo um, from AgroPages, China. How do you evaluate the current moment of advances in the releases of GMO technologies in China, and what are the expectations for this year? Uh, I'll maybe start, and then Mike, maybe you might want to comment as well, because I know you know you, your team's working very closely on this topic. So you know, we clearly see that the Chinese market uh, will open up, and there'll be biotechnology products in the market in China um, in the future. Uh, right now, I would say you can see that the products that are likely to be approved, uh, formally approved in China first, are going to be products that were created in China. Um, and not products that were, you know, were developed by companies like Bayer from the outside. Um, and then the door will ultimately, in all likelihood, open up for products from companies like ours as well. So the Chinese market will open up to biotechnology in the row crops. I'm very certain of it. Um, and I don't think they're very far away. In fact, they just published um, very recently additional rules and regulations around this. Um, paving the it's really paving the way for the approvals to take place and for products to be launched in the market space. Great. Am I have anything to add on that? Not a lot to add. Um, obviously, we know and have a lot of familiar familiarity with our seed products um, and our genetics in China. And so, as this starts opening up, uh, we feel like we're in a very strong position from a genetic position, combining with trades to really enable us to to participate. And obviously that very large market and that very unique opportunity. I think it's all part of a long term goal of China to continue to modernize its own product, you know, production. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity in a very large corn market in China to do that. OK, great. Thank you both. Uh, this next question comes from Gil Gullickson at Successful Farming, um, and maybe Rochelle, uh, this will be for you. What is phase three timing on new mode of action herbicide if all goes according to plan? And, and I can say that we are very confident that uh, everything is going to go according to plan with, uh, with that uh, new mode of action, with the uh, very good safety profile we are having for the, uh, for the molecule. So the, um, the product should be on the market by the end of the decade, so 2030. Uh, and, and phase three, it's, it's an eternal name we are giving to one of the R&D steps we are having in our process. And in uh, phase three, we, we have the risk, I would say, the molecule, and we know that uh, our, um, we will not have uh, problems in the, in the development, and we are doing quite a lot of the positioning of the product, uh, testing, uh, finding the dose rate, testing in the field, in the different uh, 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 countries and also doing some regulatory studies uh, to be able to launch the product after that. Great, thank you, Rochelle. Uh, quick question, Bob, going back to short stature corn. This one's from Argentina. When could short stature corn enter, enter Argentina? 
Um, I, I'll actually turn it over to Mike because uh, right now, it, just like in uh, you know in the North American market, we could go both with the breeding version and ultimately the biotech version. So, Mike, maybe you want to comment real quick on Argentina? Yeah, mid mid to late decade, uh, we've got the short stature corn currently being evaluated in the pipeline. So a lot of work happening on the breeding version. Um, and so the team is advancing that through the pipeline, but it would be mid to late decade before that becomes uh, available in the market. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question coming in from Cesar in Mexico. Do you expect your new corn and cotton products will make it to Mexico? How are you dealing with the import restrictions from the Mexican government? Yeah, obviously not a, a situation that we view as very favorable or very science-based. Um, it's unfortunate because I personally, it does harm to farmers in Mexico by restricting the ability to bring them the next generation innovation and technology. Um, and then it further, I would argue, creates risk for Mexico by potentially blocking the importation of these kinds of products into the Mexican market, which are very important to the Mexican food and fiber supply. So it's it's disappointed to see what's happening right now. We obviously are doing what we can to try to influence it in the right way. Um, but ultimately, you know, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But it's it's a disappointment um, to me. It's it's honestly it's less really about bear and what it means for bear than it honestly means about um, what it means to the citizens of Mexico and, and what it means for farmers in Mexico. And I, I just think it's not the right answer, but um, it is it is where we are right now. Great, thank you, Bob. Uh, question coming in from Daniel, uh, Daniel in uh, Brazil. Given the situation of drought faced by a producer, what would short stature corn be an option to face this climate issue? Yeah, I'll, I'll make maybe just real briefly comments and then Mike can also elaborate as well. I mean, again, we're, we're still exploring exactly, you know, the, the direct features that short stature corn might have on this. Um, I will say our precision breeding efforts and what we're doing in our breeding programs per se with our with our genetics uh, together with short stature corn, I do think create a really nice one two punch to continuing to evolve the crop and, and continuing to you know address challenges like water because you know as we see climate not just climate change per se, but just agriculture in general is under some significant pressure to um, you know, minimize the amount of water that gets used. So Mike, maybe you can give a little more technical answer than I just gave. Yeah, no, thanks, Bob. And um, I, I think you highlighted, you know, we're, we're on the early days of exploring this, um, but we are doing a lot of work and we've seen a lot of very interesting things in terms of how short corn responds to lower moisture and just looking at root penetration of short corn hybrids versus tall hybrids. And last summer, um, and this goes back to Bob's comment of looking at plants in the field, which is still really important for us to do. We ran a number of experiments and had the opportunity to actually look at the penetration, the depth of soil that a short corn hybrid explored versus a tall corn hybrid. And we're still building out the data, but it is truly impressive to see some of the differences of what those look like and then start thinking about what are the potentials with this technology for the situations that are described in the, in the question. So lots more to explore, lots of a lot of more experiments to be run, but the early observations are quite exciting in terms of the potential of this technology in this space. Yeah, I, I think it's convincing me of two things, Mike, in thinking about the, the root digs that took place, for example, in Nebraska last year. Um, number one is we need better technology than a backhoe yep. um, so that we can <laughs> so that we can see and visualize those root systems. And there are some technologies out there that I think can be adapted to doing analysis of root systems below ground in the field. Uh, the second one is, is it's it's, uh, you know, I, I'm worried because we can only dig six feet based on OSHA um, standards. So we, if the root systems are eight feet deep, we can't actually look right now. So just a little tongue in cheek humor here, but yeah, it's it's really interesting. Again, it's it's not highly quantitative because you know we're not digging, and you know if you have to dig a six foot hole, you're not going to look at tens of thousands of root systems. But definitely, there's something there that we think um, could potentially barely be a positive impact for a grower. Great, thank you, Bob. Next question from Greece. Is a biotech uh, trait making the seed GMO 
If true, Europe is not a target market or is this going to change? Yeah, no, I, I think the question answered itself. So yes, when we talk about biotechnology, these are GMO um, because we're talking about what I'll, um, you know, what we would consider traditional GMO products. Not to be confused, of course, with the topic of gene edited products, which are a different technology class um, and, and therefore potentially a different conversation in Europe, although even right now in Europe, um, gene edited products currently are, 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 are target, you know, they're following the same regulatory process of a GM biotech product. Um, although there's a lot of work to potentially influence that and see that you know, farmers in Europe could also potentially at least have access to different types of innovation in the future that could potentially be based on gene editing. But for now, the things I talked about today that are biotech, those are GM products, which is again why we are not targeting them for the European market space as asked earlier. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, and we'll take one final question. Um, looks like it came in from uh, Argentina. How much does it cost to develop and bring to market a variety such as short statured, uh, short, short statured maize? Well, uh, this one's gonna be one of the more expensive ones and I don't think I have a number. And part of the reason it's more expensive maybe than most is because um, short stature corn is really it's not just about the trait, right? And if we typically bring a biotechnology trait to the market, you know, I think our rough estimates of the past would have said it's roughly 150 million for an individual product to be developed, you know, researched and developed to getting it to the marketplace for a single biotechnology trait. I think what's unique about short stature corn is um, we're working on three different ways of creating it. There's a strong relationship of this product together with genetics to ultimately deliver um, that seed to the grower. And the fact that we're also working on, um, I would say, um, developing it as a system. And so that's creating a lot of other kinds of research that maybe traditionally we wouldn't have done for uh, individual biotechnology trait where we're just looking at the weed control or the insect protection. The fact that we're trying to unlock additional value for a grower through other things, how they farm in essence, and um, how we want to put that together with our genetics makes it probably a significantly more expensive investment. Um, but that's okay um, because we think, that, again, that's why we think it's so revolutionary because it's something that ultimately we see on hundreds of millions of acres around the world um, and really can have a big impact on how a farmer farms. Great, thank you, Bob. And just to follow up to that question, does it cost more to develop a new molecule? Rochelle, you want to comment on the cost of developing a new molecule? Is it getting, uh, is it getting to... cheaper, by the way? Is it getting cheaper? <laughs> but I will not be able to answer if it costs more or, or, or less. Uh, the, the cost of, uh, of developing a molecule is around 150 million. So I'm sure that short statue corn is maybe a little more expensive than that. <laughs> it's my assumption. Yeah, I mean, just just maybe to add a little bit, um, crop protection molecules are also quite expensive to develop mm -hmm. and cost continues to go up um, because it's getting harder and harder to find ones that meet the very high standards of efficacy and safety that we put on ourselves. And um, also, especially if you're exploring new modes of action. I think the exciting part is that Rochelle's team is using um, a variety of technologies and really I would say somewhat similar to the precision breeding concept is is how do you basically do smart discovery um, targeted discovery where you identify new modes of actions first before you start screening molecules really to uh, identify ones that are going to match that target so it's very exciting to see the work they're doing and um, and it's going to make a big difference in the market in the future I'm, I'm quite confident Great, thank you, Bob. And if you could please, uh, there is a note here for clarification on the Wall Street Journal question. Um, if you could uh, just uh, speak again on short stature corn, smart corn commercial trials that will uh, be in 2023, commercial launch not until 2024. So just go over that one more time if you could. Yeah, so in 23, it'll be what we typically call groundbreakers. So we work with a limited numbers of our customers 
Um, they will have the opportunity to grow the product on, you know, they'll grow hybrids on their farm. They'll harvest those and sell, you know, just like they would any type of product that they buy and sell. So they'll have an opportunity, you know, a, a, a sneak peek. It'll give us an opportunity uh, to get some feedback from them. And then the real commercial sales really start the following year. So it is a it is a commercial transaction in 23 because they do buy the seed and, and et cetera. But we limit it's not it's not an open sale where any farmer can can go and purchase it. We just don't have the the seed available at that point. But uh, that'll happen in 24 where it'll be broadly available. Great. Thank you, Bob. So um, I think we're right at time, so it's right at eight o'clock. Um, some really fantastic questions and just really great engagement from everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, this does conclude the Bear Crop Science R&D uh, Pipeline Media Briefing. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Rochelle, Mike, and Benoit. Um, and certainly thank you to all of our guests. Um, and we hope that you found this uh, session very useful. More details on what we've discussed will be posted on cropscience.bear.com and a replay and a transcript of this call can be uh, provided upon request. A reminder to you that our teams are always available. Please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or any members of the communications team for any of your follow-up questions that you may have. Thank you again for attending and please enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Thank you.